Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hey everybody, this is Bree Noble. I'm excited to be here today with my friend Cheryl B. Englehart. I have had her on the podcast before, but we have not come on here to talk about email. And she's a super huge email nerd. She's like self-proclaimed. I'm a pretty big email nerd too. So I think this will be an interesting conversation. And before you like immediately tune out like, oh, email, it's so passe. I don't, I'm not interested in this. Just hear us out because this is all about building your fan base. So let's, uh, let's get started with just I'd love to know like just a little bit of your background in case people on here don't know you yet, which most of them do if they're in my audience. But if they don't, you know, how did you get started in music? What it's been your background and why do you love email? Yeah, well, first of all, stick around. We're, yes, it's about fan connection, but it really let's talk about how your email list can be your ATM. So <laughs> we'll get to that. Ooh, that's um, I'm a, okay. Yeah. <laughs> way way sexier and like we feel like weird about it because we're like oh that means it's about money and it's not about the connection it's all about the connection we'll get to that um i am a composer and songwriter i played the piano since i was two i studied biology at cornell university and also a lot of music and ended up double majoring um i started my my career in the advertising world writing music for jingles but also working in a really cool studio so i put together some albums i put together a band i started doing the gigs in new york city toured all over started to get placements and licensing and, and just really digging in as an indie musician and fast forward of 100,000 years. And now I'm um, doing a lot more writing, less touring. Obviously, most people are doing less touring these days, but I stopped touring about six years ago to really, really start doing some different composing projects in theater, social justice choirs, um, meditation music, and uh, have recently had a, a piece featured in People magazine on Grammy.com. I had a number one album last year in the New Age category for, year, for years, for weeks. It sat on the number one charts on Amazon and iTunes. And so sort of doing the indie musician thing. And the thing that's been really consistent for over the decade I've been a full-time independent musician has been my fan list. So that that's a nutshell. Is that, is that enough? <laughs> that is. Oh, I mean, you're like glossing over, oh, yeah, I had, had something in People. I had, you know, I was on Grammy.com. I'm like, wow, yeah. I mean, I when I heard about your thing on People, I was like, that's amazing. Um, yeah, that's and, cool. you know, the different types of genres that you're involved in is so awesome. And what I love is that you rally your fans around all of that. Like, how do you blend that all into when you talk to your fans? Yeah, I used to really, especially when I decided I was going to stop touring, because most of my fan list were people that had signed up at a show. That was how I was growing my list for years. And when I decided to sort of shift gears and pivot and I got into film scoring and I had a feature film, it's one of the reasons I stopped touring was because I needed to like be in a studio to work on this thing. Um, I was like, oh my God, when my, my fans are going to unsubscribe, they're going to leave, they're not going to care about me anymore. And I realized that over those years, I had been really nurturing them to not just become a fan of my music, but become a fan of my music career and, and me, really. Um, and that gave me a lot of permission to pivot, which I know is like the buzzword of what every musician had to do <laughs> you yes. know, in 2020 is pivot, pivot, pivot. So, you know, that that is something that I realized is actually interesting and, and works for me versus working against me. Um, it changes things up. So anytime I have a, a very clear goal or something that I know is, is happening, I share it with them. So for my new age album, I was like, oh, let's let's try to get on the billboard chart. And I just shared that over email and they were like, cool. What does that mean? <laughs> you know, they heard they've heard of billboards. So then it it's, requires me to do a little bit of education and say this is what it's it's about sales or it used to be. And it's about this. And, and this is what you can do directly that will directly affect us getting this goal. And I, it always becomes an us. So they're kind of my they're my accountability team because I say it out loud. And I'm like, oh, my God, now I have to, like, go get this thing that I <laughs> declared and they're they're they want to be on a winning team too so 
they're like, all right, so I'm going to go buy it on iTunes and I'm going to buy it on Amazon. That's awesome. Um, so that, you know, every little step of the way, this, this People magazine feature was um, a choral piece that I wrote that was based on a Martin Luther King speech. I wrote it about three or four years ago for a social justice choir. And then last summer, a bunch of choirs that had sung it all over the world were like, we want to do a virtual choral recording of this. And I ended up um, being able to connect with Martin Luther King's goddaughter, Donsley Abernathy, um, who's an activist and actress and author, and she sang the solo. And so uh, that was just ta- speaking to her and her experiences and, th- you know, being in the middle of that civil rights movement in the late 60s was so extraordinary. And we were able to to garner a lot of press because we released it in February during Black History Month. And to be able to have that conversation with my fans and to say, OK, h- who do I need to be? What education do I need before I can even open my mouth? and say something about this. And I talked to Donsley and I talked to her husband about um, what that means as a white person to be a platform for amplifying that kind of voice. And then how do I communicate that to my fans to be to, to bring them in rather than a sound like this is what everyone should be doing. This is what anti-racism looks like for me. So that was tricky to navigate. But also I was like, I can't not bring them in here either because this is a, one of the biggest pieces of press I've ever gotten, <laughs> and and B, it's just an important conversation to have. So no matter what it is, I kind of have to like swallow my my pride and my fear of what the outcome will be. I mean, it took me about two weeks to send that email. I want to be on the Billboard charts. Like I was like, oh, the second I send it, it's real, and I have to go for it. And what if I don't get it? And what if I, you know, and what if I do? And all those the fears. So that's that's uh, I just tell them all the things. That's my strategy. Talk to them. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, it is just like anyone in your life that you want to help keep you accountable or, you know, you want to get their advice or get their help or whatever, you know, the email list is not, I mean, there are people behind it, right? I think that's what, I think when artists sometimes get into email lists, they just see numbers yeah, and they forget to see that there's people behind there and you're actually connecting with them. And I know when one of the strategies that you recommend is you know, to ask them a question or to get them to respond to your, your emails. And, you know, do you find that you get a good deal of people actually writing back to you? Yeah. When, when that's my intention. Absolutely. Um, Yeah. One of my, one of my favorite ones was the subject line was, should I do it? (laughs) And that was when I was deciding whether or not I should take out a full page ad in Billboard Magazine's Grammy preview, because I was going for a Grammy in the new age category. And and my fans know that my sort of big pie in the sky end game goal is is Grammy nomination. So uh, I was going back and forth with what the cost was. And, and as an artist, just it was a 10 o'clock at night email send. But that subject line got the answer. And, and I woke up to like 30 emails and a half of them were, yes, you should do it. And the other half were, yes, you should do it. Where can I send some money? Ooh. And I didn't even... I wasn't thinking I'm going to crowdfund this. It was due in like three days. Like I, I had it designed, but I was still like wondering if I should pull the trigger on it. And they, and one fan was like, I will match $2,500 for the first $2,500 that, so I had a fan matching and then I told, and so I had to send another email that day and be like, oh my God, this is what I woke up to. Here's my PayPal dot me link. That was literally how fancy it got. Um, and we funded the whole cost of that, that ad in 48 hours. And it's just worth saying that my list is not tens of thousands of people. Um, I grew it when I was touring and I have done a little bit. I haven't put money into ads yet. I know that there are strategies around that I've tested out with some other lists of mine, but my fan list is under 2000 people. Hmm. So this is not like a, in 48 hours to raise, it was $5,000 that we raised and you need 5,000 or 10,000 subscribers. You don't. You don't. You just need the right subscribers and you need yeah. to have developed a relationship over time. Yep. The right subscriber that has been nurtured and who gets it. Yep. So let me ask this because I was on Clubhouse the other day and you know, there were some younger artists that were in the group I was in. And and I kind of have this feeling in my mind, like everybody knows about email, you know, a lot of people know they should do it, but aren't doing it. But most people know that they should be doing it. And there were some people in there like, oh, I'm glad you mentioned email. I didn't even think that I needed to do that. And I was like, what? Like my mind was blown because in my world, you know, that's just a common thing, right? So I'm curious, do you still get a lot of people who are like, 
email, I should be doing that. And, you know, why is that important in this day and age? Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, I know that that conversation is out there. I personally don't get it. I think it's because my mastermind and the my courses and stuff there for musicians that are sort of in it for the long haul and, and have done the hemming and hawing over do I want to be a musician or I'm just doing my very first song ever so that that's just a different crowd that I'm I'm sort of not really into so maybe it comes up there but what I hear more of that's I think probably related is I know it's a thing I should be doing and I don't know either why or where to start. Like what's the tech, like the tech block of like setting it up and making it like not be a thing that stresses you out is a big thing. But I will say to like the younger people that are just starting out or, or thinking that it's not a thing um, or that people aren't on email, there's a ton of statistics that show it's not true. You cannot sign up for any social media platform without an email. So, um, that it's just everyone has an email. <laughs> I think that's a really good point that like, yeah, there's social media, but what's behind that email, right? Yeah. Because they want to keep in touch with us, right? And and Facebook and all, you know, Instagram and all of them, they know that they want to get us on, on their email train as well. So that's a really good point. I think this particular person I was talking to was somebody that was fresh out of school. They yeah. were going to be releasing their, you know, first album or single or something in a few months and they were like, you know, what can I do? Yeah. And I was like, oh, do you have an email list yet? What's that? You know, and I was like, oh man, I find that people are overwhelmed by the idea of an email list and also the stress of needing to produce content. So I'd love to hear mm. you know, what you kind of advise on that. Yeah, well, as a musician, you are a content creator by nature. So you kind of need to shift that like passion that you have for creating the musical content to, I suggest two to four weeks total to set up your, your content. If you're going to really do like, okay, I'm going to set up automated emails that are ready to go and, and are, are sent out when someone subscribes, they get this series and then they get this series. And then I, when I have a pre-save or a, a release coming out, I have these emails already written. Like you, if you give yourself two to four weeks to create that content and just sort of like, I want to just think like, you kind of got to get over yourself. Like, oh no, I only like to create music. I don't want to do that. Kind of like put that, put that hat on, sit down and write. And it's telling your story. It's talking about yourself. I mean, we all like to talk about ourselves. Um, but when you've got a structure and a strategy in place, you're, you're definitely, and, and an outline, you're going to have such an easier time than just sitting with a blank slate and being like, I should be writing emails. I don't know what these are. And that's, that's what I really get to the core of in my all the things I teach and the challenges I do and all that stuff is like really what, how can we like simplify this so that your brain just easily wants to write that email and just tell that story and, and share that one link and do that one thing so that it is not overwhelming, but it does take just having sort of a linear strategy. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that they don't realize that they may have already created some of this content and, yes. you know, maybe they've done a live stream already where they told their story around this thing. And all they need to do is go back and watch that, take a few notes, you know, on what were the high points and then write it out. Yep. That and or grab a clip of that and just share the video and say, yeah, hey, that's too video for you. Plop. Done. Send um, or schedule or put into the series and automate. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's the thing is that they've been a lot of them know that they needed to be creating stuff for social media and they were doing it and they think email is a whole new ball game and it doesn't have to be because you've been creating stuff already you can repurpose yeah and the stuff that you want to really create if you want to just get into some like actual things is your welcome series is the most important four emails that you ever send it will determine your subs your subscriber will determine in those first couple emails that you send out whether or not they're sticking around for the long haul um and they're also going to be your highest open rate emails that you ever send ever period end of story um so your those four emails are so important the welcome series um and then and you're setting up expectations and you're sort of catching them up what you missed um and then there are what I call the nurture series and the rise series. Their, their nurture series are basically small, short, easily consumable. They can be um, videos, they can be a variety of different things, but they're telling your story. They're going back and telling your story. They're telling about the people in your life. They're giving some, you know, you're sharing some little anecdotes or stories behind songs or videos. 
and you're you're slowly you're sending those out maybe once a week for four weeks and then you a rise series is also known as a selling series where you're actually promoting something one thing and whether that's to get people to follow you on spotify or if it's to sell a bundle of your past CDs that are still sitting in your closet. You can have these sort of ongoing campaigns that um, can be working for you in the background. And and those are sort of the three main series that once you get those written um, and then just put into whatever email platform you end up choosing and getting masterful at, you will, uh, you'll kind of be ready, ready to go. And I always like to say the the point of setting it up like that, automating, um, you can get kidnapped by aliens or go on vacation for four weeks and like your fans are still going to be getting stuff from you and you're not going to be like, oh my God, I have to get back so I can like write, write a newsletter. <laughs> you don't do newsletters, people. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I know we always, I always talk about the newsletter thing and I am still finding so many musicians I talk to are still doing the newsletter thing. And I'm like, how can they be doing this? Cheryl it's and I stressful. are preaching this all the time. <laughs> and stressful. people are still it's doing stressful. it all the time. Yeah, the newsletter, the typical newsletter, the one and and let's define between you and me all the all the bad things about newsletter because people are like, wait, I do newsletters. So newsletter is what we call like a broadcast and in, in meaning like the people that are on your list right now are getting it. So if someone if you send out a newsletter right now, someone that signs up tomorrow won't have received it, right? So it's going out in real time based on your time. And they tend to be basically fancy versions of here's what's up with me with a lot of links probably some pictures and and it's a little overwhelming here's and, everything i did over the past month yeah you know. they're like a little bit diary entry meets a little bit like trying to advertise all the things that you've got going on and trying to get someone to do something they they generally just throw enough links at them they'll click one of them right oh yeah that <laughs> hey listen i understand the logic behind that. If you have enough choice, if you walk into a shoe store and you have enough choices, if there are 1,000 shoes, you're probably going to walk out with a pair of shoes. But if I walked into a shoe store and there are 10 shoes, they're, if they were the shoes that I wanted, like that would, that would probably be an easier choice. But here's the thing, like we are in a society right now in an in a online culture of single topic scrolling. Facebook and Instagram have taught us, and even Twitter, have taught us that when we scroll, we see a picture, there's a caption about the picture, and the comments are about the picture and the caption. It's all one topic. That is our experience now with social media and our swiping and our, and all that. It's, it's a one topic thing. Email, while more intimate, will, you will have like exponentially higher returns and engagement over email in email versus social media. There are tons of studies that prove that it's, we still want to honor what we sort of trained ourselves from social media, which is the one topic scroll. We want that email to have one focus, one, one link, the link, the link can be several places. It can be the picture. Then they click on, it can be in the text. It can be in a PS, but it's one thing that you're talking about and sending them to. And that is actually what's going to get them to click, not the hundreds of options. And also people want to support your dream, not your 700 dreams that, you know, like if you're not clear on what it is you want, they're not going to be clear either. So they're not going to take any action. So when you give them all these different things going on, you, you're not telling them what's most important to you. Therefore, they don't think anything is important. Hence no clicks. Yeah. And you're just, you're, you're overwhelming them. You're making their decision very difficult. You know, you want their decision to be yes or no. Not right. like, do I want this, 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 or this? Oh, I can't even decide, so I'm doing nothing. Right. For every link, there's a yes or no. Do I want to click on this decision they have to make? So the the more links you have, the more micro decisions they're making versus the one, like you said, am I going to click or not? One big decision. That's it. And, and I love, like on the same line, what you say about the subject line, like the job of the subject line and the, then the job of the, you know, first line and the job of the, you know, all that with the email. So maybe you can outline that. Yeah. So one of the other big mistakes that I see a lot, and you probably see too, is when the subject line is summarizing the email. So like a good example is my CD comes out tomorrow. You're not giving the, and that that's probably a subject line that most of us has used, like new CD out tomorrow. Maybe there's an exclamation point or emoji or something, but um, you just, told the reader everything they need to know. And unless they're like a already a fan that they like want the link, they don't they don't have any reason to open the email. You told them the gist. 
So, like, the subject line, the job of the subject line is not to summarize the email. The job of the subject line is to get them to open the email. The job of the email is to get them to click. So if you're trying to um, get someone to f purchase your new sweatshirt on your merch store, um, the, you want to be really getting them into the, like, the feeling of the sweatshirt, how soft it is. Maybe there's like a, a picture of a fan wearing it and how great they look. And there's, there's like some feelings, right, that will get them to click. You don't need to be getting into the price and, and the checkout process and all that stuff necessarily because the job of the, the job of the email is to get the click. The job of the landing page, wherever they land after they click, whether it's your web page or Instagram or whatever you're trying to get them to do, the job of that page where they land is to close the deal. So even if that is to just, you're simply asking them to follow you on Instagram, your Instagram account is going to have them follow you or it's gonna look like a mess and they're not gonna follow you. It's the job of the page to get the close, to close the deal. In that case, it was to get the follow. So a lot of times I see musicians trying to bring the job of the landing page into the subject line. You know, like buy my sweatshirt, it's only $19.99 for this week only. Like. Ah, I don't want a sweatshirt. Yeah, because you haven't read this great story about this this fan of mine drinking their hot chocolate with the sweatshirt. Of course they don't want it yet it's because we gave it away in the subject line. So job of the subject line to get the open, job of the email to get the click, job of the landing page is to close the deal, whatever that is. I love it. I love that succinct way of saying it. And I just want to highlight, you know, the subject line is all about curiosity, right? And I'm not saying that I don't ever put subject lines that say, come to this free class. Like sometimes you want to be very specific, but yeah. sometimes you want to build up curiosity. I did one last week that was like, I recorded my first album at 2 a.m., right? That was my subject line. And they're probably thinking like, that's weird. Like, I wonder what she, what's she talking about, you know? So then they'll open the email to read my story about why I recorded my album at 2 AM, which was a pretty funny story. And I then really that did. will lead them into, oh, okay. So she's talking about this class where you can learn to produce music from home. Um, and this is why she was doing it at 2 AM because she was able to do it from home and, you know, oh, maybe that would work for me too. That might be cool. And then they'll click on it. Right. But if I just say that in the, in the subject line, they'll immediately make a decision instead of being right. like led down the path that you want to lead them. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, the curiosity is a, is a huge part. Like, should I do it being one of my most opened, uh, emails. And one of my other ones back when I was touring, I said, um, I'm playing the same night as Dave Matthews and, right. and then I opened the email and I, you, you can only get cheeky so many times. And I was like, Dave Matthews is playing in San Francisco. I'm playing in New York. Um, <laughs> and, you know, but there was definitely like that was and people wrote back like, ha ha ha. And you can't trick them a lot, but like you, every once in a while. And I'm cheeky with my list. So they know that about me. But curiosity is actually one of four different types of subject lines that I encourage people to use. So curiosity is definitely like one of the greatest ones. Um, related to curiosity, but slightly different in terms of semantics is FOMO, fear of missing out. So this idea that that there might be something that other people are going to. Um, it's great with live shows or your, you know, live streaming, things like that. Or if there's any sort of like event type things, that fear of missing out, like all the cool kids are doing it kind of thing. The third one is value for them. Like if there's something that they're going to get, like in your story about um, writing the record at 2 a.m., like that there could have been a, you, you could have had four different subject lines. One of the curiosity, which you did, um, the the FOMO, you know, all the cool kids are producing this idea that like this could raise your bottom line and value. To, it doesn't necessarily mean money, but yours, you know, being able to produce your own music is going to save you money and blah, blah, blah. So what's the value for them? And then the last one is urgency. Like there's this is going to run out like you're like the pre-save. You know, obviously we all have deadlines for pre-saving campaigns and things like that. Um, so the the time the time factor can be a good reason to open an email. People are going to be like, wait, what am I, what am I going to miss? And they're, they're all sort of related in some ways. There's curiosity, there's FOMO, blah, blah, blah. But if you're really thinking from one of those four places, you're probably going to write a good, 
a good subject line. Um, the other like litmus test that I have for subject line, if you read the subject line to a total stranger and they have a question, like my, just going back to, should I do it, right? Should I do my, run my billboard ad? I didn't, the, the subject line wasn't, should I run a billboard ad? It was, should I do it, right? So there's a curiosity and, you know, but if I said that to a stranger, they would be like, do what? Or, and for years, like, why did you write your album at 2 a.m.? Like, why not at, why did you write it in the middle of the night? <laughs> um, like, if there's like a what or a why or a how question that it, just imagine walking down the road and just like saying the subject line. If someone understands exactly what you're talking about and the message you're sending, it's probably what should be in the email content, not the subject line. Most likely. And there are exceptions to every rule that all the things I'm saying, take this all with a grain of salt. These are just sort of generalities to get out of our what we think we should do or if we're just stuck and we're sort of summarizing the email. Yeah, and, and not using the worst subject line ever, which is March update. Oh, my God. <laughs> Shoot me in the face. <laughs> which I see all the time. No, right. no. Update, March update. Oh, no. Like that's yeah. exciting. That really makes you want to open it. That sounds boring as heck. I'm sorry. I mean, I know that your fans love you, but like how, you know, you've got to, your kids love you, but you got to give them incentive to do stuff too. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you're, if you're getting 40% open rate with that, all I would say is I wouldn't say keep doing the same thing. I would say try doing a good subject line and you might get 60% open rate. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so as far as like open rates and stuff like that, actually what, what, I get, I see artists getting all freaked out about is their unsubscribe rate. So I'd love to hear oh. you talk about that. Oh, oh sweeties, <laughs> sweeties. Listen, when someone says goodbye to your emails, you, first of all, you can look at your report. If it's around 1% of the people that like, don't freak out. If 15% of your list unsubscribes from an email, I would take a very good look at what you are writing. Um, and if it happens, if more than 3% unsubscribe every single email, we we, we got to take a look at your emails. But for the average musician that I work with that I see, there are always like one to five people subscribing each email, unsubscribing each email, and um, or around 1% or under. And it's okay. And, I, and again, there are exceptions to this. There might be something extraordinarily awful that you're doing. And you might be sending four emails a day, every day of the week. That would be a good reason not to subscribe. But if you're just doing your, 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 you've got your welcome series set up, you're sending an email once every month when you're selling something, you've got something exciting, you're sending an email every day for a couple of days, that's totally fine. But, and people will unsubscribe. They are not your ideal fan. And, and that is okay. And the name of the game is to find the ideal fans, to find the person that's going to stick around for the decades, through the pivots, through the the slow times, through the times where you forget about your list and you ghost them. Like all, th those are the people you want. And if they're unsubscribing, they are saving you the trouble of having to go through all the people that haven't opened your email in six months, sending them through a re-engagement series to try to get bring them back. And then if they don't click or do anything, then you got to delete them because your deliverability is being affected. You actually don't want to have a big list that is mostly people that are not opening. It it basically is telling the internet gremlins that you might be spam and so less emails will actually get delivered. I'm not, ta I'm not talking about open. So if there's a little techie thing. You want to keep a quote clean list, people that are, are engaged and you want to keep that open rate between 20, above 20%, ideally. Like I think that in the high 30s is better, but that's, that's that. So don't freak out if someone unsubscribes. It always bums me out. So here's the thing. I'm an empath. I want to be liked. I have all my stuff that I've brought with me from my childhood. We all have our stuff. And every time I go and check my statistics, even if I have like a 60% open rate, which happens with some of my emails sometimes, and I see like 0.2 unsubscribe rate, I get a little sad, not about my awesome open rate, but about the unsubscribe. I'm like, who would dare? <laughs> Look at these 60% of my list. I put so much work list. into this email. <laughs> 60%. So I still do it too, but you just, it's just data and when you start getting your series going it will be it's going to be really great you can look at okay i have five email nurture series i have a 50 percent open rate 40 52 49 27 52 okay let's look at the subject line for that 27 like clearly my list is ready and opening but something happened with that 27 percent. so i change subject lines every once in a while i'll go in and do an audit at least every four months kind of just look at those stats look at the unsubscribe rate okay the unsubscribe rate is high like if it's one percent one percent four percent one percent one percent i'll go to that email with the four percent 
And I'll be like, oh, I was like kind of leading into a PS, which was a sell, rather than like tell a story and like leave it and then have a, hey, if you're curious about this in the PS, it was a little like, it felt a little slimy, manipulative, like like old school, like car salesy. And I was like, oh, it was just a little bit of language Tetris that I needed to do and change that. So as you get going, you start to use that information as data versus personal, making it mean something personal that you have to go journal about for four hours. Um, so you just kind of got to strip the emotions out of it. And I, I get it. And it's just good data to have. Yeah. And I love that you're talking in percentages, because I know as my list has grown, I'm like, oh, my gosh, so many people every day when I write, you know right. what I mean? And sometimes people get into that mode of like, I'm afraid to write an email because I know I'll get unsubscribes. And so then they don't write anything. And they've got this list that's doing nothing. So what's the point of it, right? If you got an asset, yeah that you're not actually, you've got your money under your mattress and you're not putting it in the bank and investing it to get, well, not a bank these days, you're putting it into mutual funds and you're going to get a return from it. But basically not writing emails to your list because you're afraid of unsubscribes is like putting your money under your mattress. Yeah. And and think about it like if you're in a room with 100 people that you're performing for. So it's like a mid-sized, small club, right? And imagine 100 people in front of you, that 1% unsubscribe is essentially one person in the audience not clapping after every song Mm. like just one and if you're gonna get super bummed out and that's gonna mess with you like we got to do some personal work there to get some tougher skin because this is not the industry to have that kind of (laughs) be messable with you got to be a little unmessable with but that's that's what it looks like if you're a visual person is that one person that either doesn't clap or leaves in the middle of the set and you're like Mother effer, why? What? <laughs> what? But there's 99 people who get it. And What's also, wrong you with you? Know what the deal is maybe they got a call and their kid is throwing up and the babysitters, you know what I mean? Exactly. Like you never know what's going we on. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. But all we know is that they can't be with us. Right. So Godspeed. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So the last thing I, I really want to touch on is that I get a lot of questions about is how often should they email their list? And you know, do you, so let's say they don't have all their series yet. Like they've got to do that work, Sure. but maybe they have a very small list of like, maybe it's only like 150 people. Okay. How often should they be emailing them and what should they be saying? So if you have a list, either, even if it's, I'm talking 50 people to hundred people, I don't know if that's people that you've asked in person, like your friends and family, can I put you on my emailing list? Or if you've actually gone ahead and created a little form for people to sign up. If you created a form, even if you're just using like the form on Banzoogle, and I know you're a fan of Banzoogle too, which is not a platform that yet allows you to automate, but you can give a free MP3 very easily through that um, and send an automated first email. That first email needs to be set up so that you can manage people's expectations that you're going to be sharing stuff with them and blah, blah, blah. So you need to have... I know if you're you, you don't have all the series set up yet, that's fine. But you need to have that that welcome email at the very least set up. So I just need to say that. So if you, assuming you don't have anything else set up, they've been welcomed. Tell them how often you're going to write them. And if you love writing and sharing and you've got a lot of stuff going on right now, like if you're coming out with an album, you're doing a single a month and like each week you're, you know, you're if you're doing a single and then one week you're talking about the iTunes pre-save and then the next week you're talking about um, or Spotify pre-save and then the iTunes pre order and you know each week you have something to talk about like in your welcome email say like hey i've got a lot of stuff coming up this year expect to hear from me like once a week or once every two weeks and i'm always open to hearing what you want to say if you're in between projects and you're just going to slowly sort of tease out your story and like talk about what's going on and where you have been then you can tell them that in the welcome email too like you can expect to hear from me a couple times a month maybe once a month but i would say a minimum is once a month like if you are if you don't have anything set up like i People are like, how often do you write your email? I'm like, I've got all my series set up. Like, I know people are receiving emails from me right now, and I can get kidnapped by aliens or go on vacation for two months, and it would be fine. Yes, I shared when I got in People Magazine last month. Like, yes, I share, I'm share. i sharing that, like, I just announced that I'm going to drop an album this year, and so I'm doing singles for the first time, you know, in, like, 10 years. So I'm definitely, like, got stuff to say. But before the People thing, I maybe like three or four months that I sent a broadcast. Like, so if you've got the stuff set up, you're in a good position. If not, I would say once a month. And here's the thing, you don't need to sit down and write essays. I I used to make this mistake where I would have to take like five hour chunk out of my day to like sit down, like, what am I going to write? 
I have a note on my phone that's an ongoing like email ideas um, and it's just like little blips of things and it's so easy when you have an idea already to sit down and just like write a couple sentences. People don't need to read essays. If you lo use um, loom.com, it's a free Google plugin. You can just go on a video and it creates a link right there and you can send people to a loom link. You don't need to like edit it, download it, upload it to YouTube. You save like a bunch of steps. And so you could just like make a video message for, for people like, hey, it's been a while. I actually have no idea what to talk about, but this is what's happening in my world. I would love to just hear from you. Like what's going on? Are you back in your office? Like tell me the things. And and you, could, you know, if you have nothing else other than that, just touch base very quickly. So I, to answer your question in a very long winded way, I would say a minimum once a month feels good to me, but you got to you got to know your list and, and you can also set them up for whatever you want to do. Yeah. I love that setting expectations. And, and I kind of tell people like, if you've got a hundred, 150 people on your list, once a month is fine. As their list gets bigger, I think it's not only is it better to connect with them more often, maybe twice a month as it gets to maybe 500, but also there's just going to be more to talk about. Cause if your list is growing like that, that means you're doing stuff, right? So you got more to say. Yeah. I, it's funny. I would like, I like that. And then I like half of me is like, yes. And the other half is like, I actually disagree with that. I think that if you have a hundred, if you have 10 people on your list, like treat your list as if there's a hundred thousand people on that list mm -hmm. and love on them and ask them to go share, like bring them in. They, you have an opportunity to bring this small group of people in, but they don't know that there's only 10 people on the list versus a yeah. hundred versus a thousand versus 10,000. And if they can tell the difference, what are you, how are you writing differently? Mm. Like when you get a thousand people on your list, are you writing, Hey guys, and like not treating them like individuals anymore. Cause you're going to lose those people really fast. So I like to, to, if you have a small list, treat it like a big list. And if you have a big list, treat it like it's a small list, like very personal, vulnerable, the bigger the list gets, the probably the more strangers that are on it. And that's going to start to put up some personal walls. And so you're not going to be sharing as vulnerably as if you know your list is only your 25 closest friends and family, right? So yeah, I'm of, I'm of different minds. There's lots of different ways to look at this. But I, I would say that if your timing feel, if, you, if you're in your head, your list was a thousand or 10,000 people, and you feel like with a bigger list, you would want to write more often, then you should probably get in the habit of writing more often. Yeah, I think that's that's really good. And I mean, the reason I give those guidelines is people people beg me. Like they're like, just tell me how you know how often yeah, you write. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, all right, well, here's something. You don't have to abide by this, but and sure. but I love that idea of like treating them, you know, like gold and as if they were a list of ten thousand, but not speaking to them like a list of ten thousand is super right. important. And the great thing is nobody knows that there's only fifty people on your list. It's not like when you go to a performance and only ten people show up and everyone it's clear that <laughs> People there, oh my right? god, I've had so you many of give them the best performance ever, but you know. Yeah, you try to, right? You're like, I'm going to perform as if there's a thousand people in this room. And then when you're when there's a thousand people in this room, you're like, I'm going to perform as if there's one person in this room. Like it goes both ways, right? That's good. I love that. I love that. Well, let everybody know where they can uh, find out more about you and what you do as far as your music career and your uh, obsession with email. <laughs> <laughs> Well, everything for me is uh, cbemusic.com, like me as a musician. You can get to all my musician resources stuff from there. But on Instagram, I'm CBE Music, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Clubhouse, TikTok, all the things. Um, except on Twitter, I'm CBE. But I will tell you, all this stuff uh, around email and the courses and all the things that I provide for musicians that I've sort of learned from myself and gone down the deep, dorky rabbit holes is at In the Key of Success. And I do have an Instagram there. And... Um, if you go to inthekeyofsuccess.com, there's a free workbook on mastering email, it kind of lays out the linear strategy to kind of help wrap your head around this whole big nebulous thing that is email. So you can go there um, and grab that. Awesome. And it's so funny because I think back to the first time we did an interview, man, it was 2015. Like it was in the very first year of my Maybe. female entrepreneur and musician podcast. <laughs> so it's like, here we are in 2021 and we're still doing stuff together. You're still I rocking and I'm still rocking. So it's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. And a couple times a year, I run a five day free email challenge, but you can tell your people about that because I know, I, you know, that will be, it, there's always one coming up. Yes. And it, I will definitely keep anyone that is on my list or in my world informed about her challenges because they're amazing. And I am a huge proponent of email and I do talk about it a lot, but I don't, I don't 
focus on it as laser focus as she does. So that's why I like to bring her in as, you know, for people that really want to geek out and, and create an amazing list that, like she said, actually brings in money for you as an artist. Yeah, I will. I'll end with this one. My favorite fact that I say about email is when you are doing email correctly, and yes, there is a right and wrong way to do email. When you're doing it correctly across industries, the number, the golden number is you will be making one to two dollars per subscriber per month. So let's turn that into a real thing. If you have a thousand subscribers, you'll be making one to two thousand dollars per month by the end of the year. So by the end of the year, you can look at it and that would be twelve to $24,000. So that could look like a campaign, like if you did a Kickstarter for a CD that might all show up in one month or your Patreon over time, or it might be pre-releases or pre-orders. Um, it could be merch, all sorts of things. So you might have ebbs and flows one month. It might be not a lot. And it doesn't mean that every person is paying you a dollar. It means that it will come out in the wash. That's Those are the numbers. $1 per subscriber per month is what it's going to look like when you finally got your email up and running. Yeah. And I've done that calculation on all the lists that I've had. And it always ends up to be true. I'm always like, could it really, maybe not in this industry or maybe not in this, this particular, nope, it's true. <laughs> yep. It's really true. And I learned, I mean, I was always great with email, my email list. It's why I was like, okay, maybe there's something here I need to know more about. And I, I got certified as a digital marketing expert through digital marketer and their program on email. That's like super techie deep dive. Um, it was all about selling mattresses. Like it, doesn't matter. Like my my email course, Rock Your Email List, is it's totally geared for musicians. But then I'll have an artist or someone like, can I do your course too? I'm like, yeah, one thousand. If I can learn on selling mattresses, <laughs> yes, you can come sell. We talk about selling your merch, digital products, services, like all the things. So, it is it's applicable for everybody. Yeah, it is. It is a universal skill. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this, letting us geek out about email. Um, on, Anytime. Yeah, it's so it, I love it personally. And I just don't think enough people are taking advantage of it. So I'm so glad you're out there teaching it. Yay. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.